So I'm going to talk to you today about <clears throat> understanding the accuracy of beliefs formed across social networks. And in particular, I want to talk about uh, why I think we need normative theories, uh, that is theories of how we should behave uh, and how optimal agents would behave uh, if we want to understand uh, these issues. So there is, of course, a huge body of research relevant to belief formation across social networks. Uh, there's a huge uh, body of psychological research on opinion dynamics in groups that stretches back many decades. And there's also a huge body of modeling research uh, that comes in different flavors, that modeling research. Uh, there's a whole corner that uh, takes a kind of social physics perspective and looks at opinion dynamics across networks uh, through the lens of models borrowed from physics, such as Hopfield networks. And there's also uh, a kind of epidemiological perspective, which thinks of uh, the spread of opinion as a type of contagion and uses models from epidemiology for the same question. And those kinds of paradigms are hugely informative and have told us a lot about the spread of opinion. But uh, there's a crucial question that I personally am interested in that that kind of, kind of modeling completely leaves out. Uh, in particular, I'm interested in the truth or accuracy of our beliefs uh, and beliefs formed particularly in the context of social networks. So what's crucial to this question is the, the fundamental distinction between opinions versus beliefs or facts. So opinions are things like, I think chocolate is great. Uh, there's nothing true or false about that. You can have different views uh, on chocolate and we can both be completely right. Uh, that's not the case uh, with beliefs about facts. Uh, facts are true or false and our beliefs uh, about those facts either match reality or they don't. So if I want to understand what impact uh, social networks have on the truth or falsity of our beliefs, at the very least I need a modeling context where in the model there's a kind of ground truth uh, that I can compare agents' beliefs to. So some work along these lines exists, but it's a tiny, tiny proportion of the wider body of work on opinion dynamics. So there's some work using the de Groot or Lehrer Wagner Hexamonikaza framework, depending on your disciplinary background, you'll be familiar with different variants those models. And there's also work uh, in social epistemology within philosophy that's probably uh, less familiar to people in this community. Uh, in particular, I'm going to be drawing on one uh, model from that literature in the following, which is the model by Olson, 2011. So if I were to uh, approach the question of the accuracy of our beliefs in social networks from a sort of social epistemological perspective, then really what we're dealing with is the question of testimony, right? Testimony is how uh, philosophers or lawyers or psychologists think about uh, the, the context in which we get uh, claims about the world from other sources. And what I want to convince you in the remainder is that for understanding testimony, uh, we really should look at tools of what optimal agents should do and that doing that is not only going to be uh, crucial for trying to make the world a better place in some ways and improving the accuracy of our beliefs, but it's even going to be useful just for plain old descriptive research. So the problem of testimony, as a, as a philosopher might think about it, is that uh, much of what we believe to know we know uh, through the testimony of others, a large part of our knowledge. But the question is how can stuff that we know from other people lead uh, to accurate beliefs, given that those others are typically less than fully reliable? So I'm speaking to you now, I'm trying my best. I'm a good faith actor. Uh, but I still say things all day long that turn out to be false. So how do you factor in rationally that partial reliability in revising your beliefs in response to what it is I'm saying? Well, it's, it's the whole point of uh, Bayesian models in a way that you can deal with uh, less than perfect sources. But there's a problem with applying such models uh, in many real world contexts of testimonial evidence. And that's 
uh, that we typically don't actually know the true reliability of our sources. You, you've just encountered me for the first time. Uh, how are you supposed to assign in Bayesian terms the relevant likelihoods to what it is that I'm saying and the evidence I'm providing? Um, but there's an even more fundamental problem in the context of testimony, which I think has been overlooked, which is that we're not just dealing with the typical single source uh, or what we think of as the typical single source, both we and that source are also part of wider social networks and that will have systematic effects. So I'm going to look at uh, both of these problems and the impact they have on the accuracy of our beliefs and also how these problems interact. But I'm gonna start with the, the second one, the impact of social networks. So uh, the first thing to note here is that uh, there's already lots of evidence that the mere structure of a social network has uh, accuracy implications for the beliefs of agents in that network. So even when you keep those agents and individual agents stays exactly the same, you change the wider network around that, you're going to get uh, differences in accuracy for that agent. We know that from behavioral experiments. People get taken into the lab and uh, do experiments in network contexts. But we also know that from uh, a wealth of simulations. What I'm particularly interested in is uh, simulations that uh, involve agents that are trying to do this in the best possible way. Agents that have been put forward as rational or normative uh, optimal models. And with such agents too, you find systematic effects of network structure. And I'll tell you a little bit more in the following about why that is. So uh, in the model that I'm going to be using in, in, in the following, you have simple Bayesian agents, and these agents uh, live in a very dull world where there's only a single fact that's at issue, a single claim, and they receive evidence from the world about that claim, but they also receive a
So comparing these two columns allows us to factor out uh, the effects of communication. And what we see is that while individual accuracy rises in all cases as a result of communication, uh, there's a drop in collective accuracy. So these two things are going in opposing directions. And that too is as we'd expect, and we'd expect on the basis of a whole bunch of formal results in the literature, uh, in the context of the squared error measures, there's the diversity prediction theorem, in the context of voting, there's the Condorcet jury like theorems. And it's a common feature of all of these that they show that mathematically individual accuracy, collective accuracy, and the degree of interdependence between agents uh, is linked. And of course, communication affects that degree of dependence. So that's a sort of first pass of effects of network structure and communication in networks on the accuracy of our beliefs. But I now want to hook that up uh, with the second uh, problem, which was actually the first problem I mentioned, which is that we don't typically in the real world or often don't know the true reliability of our sources. And on that issue, we have been doing a whole bunch of work in, in recent years uh, showing that there's a common strategy that people actually use and that has adverse effects uh, in social network contexts. Uh, it fuels polarization and it also generates overconfidence. Uh, there are three sessions on polarization here in this conference, so I thought it might be more interesting to speak about the overconfidence results. But not only does this strategy have these effects uh, in a social context, it does actually very little to promote accuracy. So what is this strategy? <coughs> well, in general, when faced with a source, trying to deal with their less than perfect reliability, you could do sort of three things in principle. You could just assume a particular degree of reliability for an unknown source and stick with it. So you assume they're just going to be moderately reliable and you just run with that number. And that sort of makes sense with humans in, to the extent that it must be the case that people are more likely to be um, accurate than inaccurate because otherwise there would be little point to our communication and we wouldn't maintain these elaborate systems for human communication. You might also be able to draw on a track record uh, where people have said things to you in the past and you eventually find out whether these things are true or false and you can use that to calculate a sort of frequency that you can use as a, as a probability uh, of being correct. But there are many contexts where you can't do this, and last but not least, the person that you've just met. And here there's a third strategy available that runs like this, which is that you basically use the plausibility of their current uh, evidence, given what you presently believe but don't know to be the case, to estimate their reliability. So to use a simple example, I say to you the earth is flat and in response to that you slightly increase your belief uh, that the earth might indeed be flat but you also, because this is not congruent with your present beliefs about the truth or falsity of the flat earth hypothesis, you slightly decrease your estimate of my reliability. So crucially, of course, you don't know for sure whether or not the Earth is uh, round or flat. So you're using uh, your present uncertain uh, beliefs and the expectations that gives you for the evidence that you receive to adjust both your beliefs about the claim at issue and the reliability of the source you're dealing with. And if you do this uh, repeatedly over multiple interactions, uh, then you will at each time step be estimating both your beliefs in this claim and the reliability of this reporting source. Now this strategy sounds intuitive and I guess it sounds intuitive because there is actually considerable evidence that this is what people do, something like this. And we've got a couple of experimental papers that show people actually using this strategy in simple lab-based, scenario-based tasks. Um, the strategy also seems so intuitive that uh, a whole number of philosophers have considered it to be a rational or normative strategy. And uh, there are different ways of implementing this strategy in a formal Bayesian model. And we have a recent paper that surveys uh, those different attempts and 
draws out some differences in the behavior of different ways of um, formalizing this, uh, but none of that is going to be uh, of importance to what I say in the remainder. And finally, we've also conducted uh, a whole bunch of simulation work on looking at the accuracy implications of this strategy vis-a-vis -vis a single source. So uh, in those simulations, one of the things that we find is that this strategy conveys almost no benefit in terms of accuracy over this simple fixed trust strategy. And the paper goes into details of why that is. But what I want to talk about is what happens when I combine these strategies for estimating reliability with a social network context. And specifically, as I said, I'm going to look at overconfidence in social networks. So for those of you uh, who don't have a background in judgment and decision making or forecasting, uh, what's meant by overconfidence is a relationship between some sort of set of true objective probabilities and your subjective estimates as, as a forecaster or somebody providing estimates. If you're uh, calibrated, then your subjective estimates will match the objective probabilities and all of these forecasts will lie on this blue diagonal line. If you're overconfident, by contrast, uh, you'll have estimates that are more extreme than the objective probabilities. So the objective probability, for example, might be 0.25, but you think it's only 1.5. Or it might be 0.75, and you think it's 0.8 or 0.9. So your beliefs are more extreme, your, your estimates are more extreme. And there's a long tradition of looking at overconfidence and whether people are overconfident and whether experts are overconfident uh, in the judgment decision-making literature. So one of the questions we've been interested in is what happens in social networks with respect to confidence. And what we've been looking at is uh, overconfidence at a population level. There's a, a reason for looking at this at the sort of average level by just looking at is the average degree of belief in the population overconfident or underconfident? Because you can use a simple trick uh, to evaluate this. So it's a feature of a Bayesian agent that if a population of agents starts with the true base rate for an event, uh, then when they receive evidence from the world, even when that evidence is noisy, so some will be given true evidence, some will receive false positives, some will receive correct rejections, some will receive incorrect rejections, so their beliefs will wander in different levels. But if they start from the true base rate and uh, they use Bayes' rule for updating, then the population uh, will at, always stay calibrated at this population level. So I'm going to show you average degrees of belief uh, for uh, agents using different strategies for estimating reliabilities. So on the x-axis, again, we just have objective probability, which also corresponds to the base rate. And here is the mean subjective belief in the population on the y-axis. And then on the z-axis, we are varying once again the quality of the evidence that comes into this network from the world. And we have two types of agents, these fixed trust agents and the ones who are using this expectation-based updating strategy. And these here are shadow agents, that is agents uh, that are not in a social network context. So it's just a population, they're each individually receiving evidence from the world. And what we see here is evidence, uh, though only mild evidence of overconfidence in the updating agents. So particularly at the high quality of evidence levels, you see uh, that those those uh, curves are moving in, in a sharpened way from the diagonal. But the really big whopping effect happens when agents start to communicate. So we're seeing a big introduction of overconfidence just as a matter of moving to a network because we see these both for the fixed trust agents and the trust update agents. But again, we see this effect uh, magnified and stronger in the expectation-based updating agents 
And for both of these types of agents, uh, rather unfortunately, the overconfidence becomes all the more marked, the worse the evidence gets. So, so the less reason you have for being overconfident, the more overconfident these agents actually are, uh, which seems like a pretty bad thing. So why does this happen? The reason uh, you get this is because uh, the expectation-based updating uh, provides a kind of ratchet uh, that amplifies the weight of evidence. So let me illustrate this here. Imagine that uh, you're a Bayesian agent and you receive uh, a number of pieces of evidence in succession. And these are sort of unit size, so they're all equally diagnostic. And you go from one piece of evidence to kind of eight pieces of evidence. And starting from uh, an agnostic prior of 0.5, you systematically increase your degree of belief using Bayes' rule uh, in light of that evidence. Now, this is what the true evidence is, right? But if I give that same evidence to an trust updating agent, an expectation-based updating agent, the congruence with the belief as it takes shape will lead the subjective diagnosticity, the weight assigned to that evidence, to sort of increase. So it's being treated as a result as increasingly more valuable, or more diagnostic than it actually is. So that's the part of the problem that comes from not knowing the reliability. But there's also a part of the problem that comes from being in a social network context. So one of the things I haven't told you about these Bayesian agents in this model is that they're naive Bayesian agents, uh, which means that they erroneously assume that their different sources are independent when they're in fact some degree of dependence because in the social network, uh, other agents are also talking to one another, which means that the same evidence can kind of reach you in some way factored into sort of more complex judgments via multiple paths. Now, there are many contexts in which uh, simplifying independence assumptions have to be made, and there are many contexts in which uh, naive Bayesian agents do remarkably well. But in this context, it's, this assumption is problematic, yet at the same time, it's completely unavoidable. Even if you practically knew the entire structure of the network, for purely computational reasons, you couldn't actually fa factor that network structure into your belief calculations. So you're kind of stuck with this uh, from an optimal agent perspective. And that has this consequence that you've got the evidence that's kind of coming into the network that's reaching a single agent, right? But because the agent is getting that same evidence, in some sense, potentially via multiple routes, there's a kind of reduplication going on, which makes you think that there's more evidence coming in from the world than there actually is. And when I combine both of these things, I get this double whopper ratchet um, happening, which leaves me in total with this sort of overall phenomenon. So, this is something also you can see, uh, not just in the final beliefs, but in, in, in patterns of convergence. So these are sample runs of the model, different individual populations, uh, tracking the average belief over time as more and more information uh, is accrued. The blue lines are shadow agents who don't communicate. The red agents are matched agents who participate in communication. And if you would look at this one at the left here, for example, you see that the communication leads these beliefs to converge uh, more rapidly, which is as it should be because they're generally learning, genuinely learning things from other agents. But we can also compare that rate of convergence with the green line, which reflects an ideal agent, where this ideal agent basically is, is, is somebody who's just looking at all the evidence that comes into the network from the, wor from the world and updating directly on that evidence. And so under no circumstances should beliefs in the population be more extreme than that, the beliefs of that agent that has all of the evidence. Many contexts, uh, they'll be kind of quite closely matched. But we also find runs 
where actually the communicating agents in the network have beliefs that are more extreme than the ideal agents. So there's a crossover point here and from there on in, um, this network just behaves as if there was way more evidence than there actually was from the world. So, uh, what I've tried to show you here is that there are two fundamental problems with respect to testimony. One is that we typically don't know the true reliability of our sources. And the other is that uh, testimonial evidence isn't just a matter of single sources, but happens across networks. And these two problems are linked. And they have adverse consequences and negative effects on one another. So what does this all mean? Well, for one, uh, I think these simulation results and what I've showed you about these uh, shows you that uh, expectation-based updating looks like uh, motivated reasoning, right? Where people are trying to uh, form beliefs and respond to evidence in a way that's congruent with their beliefs because uh, that's emotionally desirable. But of course, these agents have accuracy motivations only. And I've showed you also that overconfidence is a natural outcome across these social networks. I think also these simulations show you that um, the computational limitations of these naive uh, Bayesian agents are deep rooted, right? And what that shows us is that the problem of testimony, both res re with respect to the, the estimating the reliability of our sources and with respect to network structure is much deeper than typically assumed. And that finally is relevant if we're interested in trying to have a better social media environment and try to fix our present information crisis, right? There are many approaches out there that take a very individualistic uh, perspective on the accuracy of agents' beliefs, inoculation methods, uh, giving people internet literacy classes, right? These simulations show that while those things might be uh, useful, there's going to be limits with how far they go to fixing the problem. So I think these normative considerations show you uh, that uh, there are alternative interpretations for descriptive research that we need to consider. I think looking at this from the perspective of the optimal agent also makes it clear that the sort of epistemic challenge we face as human beings trying to form accurate beliefs in aggregates uh, is much harder than we think and we can only see that by trying to build normative models and of course any true fix to our information crisis must ultimately also reduce the problem for the optimal agent because any problem that persists in the best possible agent is not going to be eliminable uh, by that strategy. So those are really the, the main things uh, I have to say. Uh, I'm just going to take the liberty of adding three more minutes and connecting this uh, to an applied issue that I care about. And that seemed weird to me to not talk about, given that I'd been spending uh, the last four months almost exclusively on this, which is uh, I've sp spent much of my time, most of my time in the last few months on trying to think about and do things about uh, how I as a behavioral scientist should respond to the pandemic and how we should reconfigure our behavioral science and the way we do science for crisis response. And one of the things that we've been thinking from the start here is that a transparent digital community-based forum for scientific exchange would provide an invaluable tool for dealing with this pandemic. In particular, uh, if we have such a community forum for science exchange, we could stimulate collaboration and generate new knowledge, right? We can boost the quality of new studies through early feedback. We can avoid uh, reinventing the wheel or doing many things in parallel when we could be joining forces. Uh, we can also uh, rapidly evaluate studies post publication and integrate that knowledge with knowledge that we already have. And we can do this in a way that supports the semi-automated or automated construction of large-scale knowledge bases that incorporate all of this new knowledge. 
And if we had such a community, we could also provide an interface to journalists or policymakers or citizens who want to ask questions of us as behavioral scientists. So we can think of this as a sort of black box where people can put in a, a question and out comes an answer. But crucially, it's not a black box because the whole process of the exchange is transparent. And because it's transparent and people are doing this under their own name, it also provides intrinsically a sort of dynamically evolving database of expertise. So if we had such a community, we'd be able to make use of the entire resources that we have uh, in the wider scientific community, as opposed to just relying for our science and policy advice on a handful of um, policy uh, experts that are picked from the, uh, the scientific community. And that makes sense last but not least because we want to use all of the available resources, but everything also, I told you in the results so far, suggests that the breadth of perspective matters, epistemic diversity matters, and we want to harness all of that for our response. So we've actually been trying to put this into practice by um, building, starting in March, an integrated environment, Cybe.org, which consists of a Twitter account, uh, three subreddits, and a behind-the-scenes dynamic database project. So the Twitter account uh, is, is an information account that provides relevant information to behavioral scientists about the pandemic. And the Reddits are a forum for scientists and community exchange. There's one devoted to uh, research questions. There's one devoted to meta-science. That's how should we restructure uh, how we do science for crisis response. And there's one, Ask a Behavioral Scientist, which allows anyone to access uh, the members of this community and pose a question for consideration. And because, of course, the way Reddit works, all of this can be looked at by anyone with an internet connection. And behind the scenes, this environment is, is combined uh, using a bunch of tools into a, a dynamic database for which we use Hypothesis that's uh, searchable, uh, information is tagged, and crucially what makes this database uh, different from other database projects that have been developed in the context of this crisis is that this isn't just based on papers, right? It's tweets, newspaper articles, uh, Twitter exchanges, Reddit exchanges, preprints, articles. So it's an eclectic uh, combination of information as is relevant to this very rapidly uh, evolving and changing information environment. So this has had some success in, 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 the, in the sense that it, there have been at least some occasions of use of this by journalists or, or government scientists. Uh, and it's also had some success in fostering collaboration and that novel studies have come of this and novel large-scale collaborations have come of this. Uh, if you want to read more about this, uh, there are a bunch of recent blog posts, one about the Reddit uh, and the community, and uh, one about the database that I'll draw your attention to. But the reason I'm talking about this here is because I think this project is important. The crisis won't be over for a while, and the role of behavioral science is only going to increase. But at the same time, what this project is trying to do is something that's going to be useful beyond the crisis. Because really what we're trying to do here is create from extant social media, because we had to start with what was already there, the kind of internet scientists would actually need for science. That is an information environment that promotes content and network structure conducive to knowledge creation, aggregation and dissemination. What we've got so far is kind of a proof of concept at best, right? To really make this work and to fulfill the potential of this kind of idea, we need scale, right? So we need more users. This is a conference full of behavioral scientists. Please join these subreddits as users. But potentially even more importantly, join us in developing the kinds of tools that are required to make uh, this infrastructure work. Because this conference and the researchers at it really are doing research, whether they think of it in that way or not, that provides the kinds of inputs that we need to build a better internet for science. And that might be obvious to you, um, but just in case it's not, I want to elaborate on that for 30 seconds and then I promise to be done. Right? There are a whole bunch of uh, fundamental research questions that we've sort of in the 
that we, and now I mean science as a whole, not, not any of us in our initiative, have been trying to resolve, but that are, are far from resolved and that we would really need to be able to build the kind of communities for science uh, exchange that we want. We need to understand what kinds of rules uh, should govern discourse in a transparent forum uh, in such a way that um, the goals of science are, are, are furthered. Right? What, what kinds of community engagement rules are you looking at? There, there's stuff on this in argumentation. There's work on game theory, theoretic approaches to argumentation that might let you think about um, incentives. And then there's work on uh, there are whole journals devoted to the psychology of communication on the internet. All of those are only fragments to how we, uh, we should structure the kind of discourse and try to structure the discourse that we want. At the same time, um, any forum is going to have the problem that there's going to be lots of content. And we need algorithms for content promotion. But we don't need ones that maximize ad re revenue, such as Facebook, Twitter, or Reddit. We need algorithms that promote content for knowledge creation. There's a long-standing interest already in the dynamic modification of network structure. There's key exponents of that kind of research um, also at this conference. Uh, that research doesn't go far enough, uh, in anything like what we need so far, because it, it typically, much of it hasn't actually looked at accuracy implications, it's just looked at effects on, on opinion dynamics and, and so on, and we really need the connection to accuracy, but we also need it specifically in a science context. And that kind of work is going to have to dovetail with other work, for example, on novelty detection. Uh, that, and the wider goal of um, building and using uh, the rapidly developing natural language processing tools that we have for document aggregation and connection. And there are really valuable projects uh, going on there, some of them which have already been applied to uh, the COVID-19 case, but differently from our database, only look at papers and also work uh, in the food security context, which has looked at trying to aggregate large volumes of data, uh, of uh, large volumes of text in the great uh, literature, not in published papers, but policy documents. So all of this I really want to highlight as a, uh, as a concern that follows on, and I think from the kinds of considerations I gave in, in the main body of my talk, and I hope that this conference can also be an opportunity to think more about these issues from that specific perspective. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks for your time.